Hello, um, this is Ali and I'm going to talk about uh, regression today. So um, there are two types of regression that we're going to talk about. One is linear regression and the other one is the logistic regression. In this video, I talk about linear regression. So um, our regression uh, models usually focus on the relationship between the input variables and the outcome. Um, so uh, regression in general provides an estimate of the outcome based on uh, the input value and tells you how changes in uh, input variables actually affect the outcome. Uh, the outcome uh, can be either uh, continuous or uh, discrete. So you could use discrete variables. We need to do some transformation before using them, but uh, if you have some categories that would work, for, uh, work with uh, regression as well. Um, some use cases are, for example, estimating the uh, lifetime value of a customer and understand what influences the lifetime value and how we could maybe affect that. Um, another example is to estimate the probability of loan defaults and uh, understanding what leads to a loan default. So if it is important for us to know uh, what leads to a specific outcome and um, how we could change the most important factors, linear regression and logistic regression basically are going to um, provide a simple explanation for that. Um, so uh, let's talk about linear regression. So linear regression um, estimates a, con a continuous value as the output based on um, a linear additive function of other variables. So it assumes that um, like the relationship between input and output is actually linear, uh, which is an important factor. Uh, the output of this algorithm is continuous, but the input can be either continuous or discrete. Um, so you can have categories. So for example, uh, if you want to uh, model income as a function of years of education, age, and gender, you could basically use linear reg uh, regression. Um, and also if you want to uh, like create a model for um, the house sales price on a, uh, based on a model of square footage, number of bedrooms, uh, bathrooms, and lot size, then you could use that. Then it tells you which one affects it the most. The output of this model is um, a set of estimated coefficients that indicate the relative impact of each input variable uh, over the uh, output variable. Also, it gives you an expression that tells you how you could get the actual output of that um, function that you're estimating based on the input variables. So this is how a linear regression model looks like. Um, so you've got your output and you've got a function that you want to uh, estimate. Um, so there are two, uh, this function um, is based on two uh, parameters. One is the um, W, which is um, kind of a, a uh, vector of um, parameters that uh, or coefficients that can be used, and the B is a bias. So um, you provide x the input, and uh, it will calculate the function output by multiplying each input feature by a weight that is actually um, provided in your model. So. When we train this model, when we're trying to find this model, we're actually looking to find these weights plus the bias. So once we find the uh, weights, the bias can be found by setting all the weights to zero. Um, but uh, basically that's what we wanna do. So this is the function that we're looking for. Um, and this is gonna be the, um, how we model the input and provide the output. So this x uh, i's, um, each of these are one feature, and um, b is the value of f when x i's, all of them are equal to zero. And uh, we've got an epsilon, which is a kind of some errors, which is a normal distribution and uh, with mean zero and variance um, sigma squared, and is independent of each other for each of our cases. Um, so we have, uh, one, so this is an example of uh, linear regression with only one input variable. So um, our input variable is, um, yeah, so that's variable what you see uh, beside 
at my video. Um, so imagine X1 is the number of employees reporting to a manager, okay? And um, so for example, one, two, three, four, five, etc. And you can see that we've got X1 here, okay? And the output is the number of hours per week spent in meetings by the manager. So as you know, the more employees a person has, probably the more time it requires to be spent in a meeting. And it could be maybe on a linear fashion. So we could probably model that in a linear fashion. Um, so the output function is uh, y equals to the bias plus a weight, uh, uh, which we have to find times the number of employees plus some error and this is going to be our model and uh, Using this we'll understand how many what is the um, Impact of number of employees on the total number of hours that a manager should spend on meetings uh, if you look at some of this data for example if you look at number two and If you try to find that we'll see that well it's around, I don't know, seven hours. For four, it's around 13, 14 hours. For six, it's around, um, I don't know, like 18 hours. Um, and for 10, um, yeah, it's around maybe um, 27 or so. So, uh, so using this data, we will understand that there is a probably a base need and then um, so if we get the difference for example um, so here we have 16 here we have around 13 and so for two three hours or four let's assume that is 12 okay so two to four it's gonna be like five the next one is four and for 10 it's like 25 so um, uh, we can find a number that's uh, like a bias number. Maybe if you don't have any, um, if you don't have any um, um, employees at all, like it takes like four hours to just plan for everything, right? Um, and yeah, maybe five or six hours. And then for two employees, that's gonna be the starts adding like one, two, three, four hours per employee. Uh, so you can try to model that and uh, find that relationship between different um, input variables and how it affects the outcome. So if you have categorical attributes or features, um, you should convert it and represent it in a way that linear regression can understand it. Um, there is one holding, uh, one hot encoding that, uh, of course, you could use. But for linear regression, we use a form of that that requires instead of m, um, like if you if your categorical attribute has m possible values, instead of using exactly m um, attributes like features to be added to your model, you can use m minus one binary variables to the regression model, and the reason is. Um, what we could do is that um, instead of adding one additional variable, we assign that remaining category, uh, the base category, uh, when all the m minus one uh, variables are equal to zero. So let me give you an example. Imagine that um, for our example, we not only we have managers, but we have managers of um, kind of four different um, departments. So these different departments, um, employee, uh, like that's the number of employee, and, um, and then we have the finance department, manufacturing de department, and sales department. We have one additional department here, which is the engineering department. And, um, but if you look at here, we just use only three variables, binary variables. And the engineer department, um, the engineer manager is actually determined when you put all these different values to zero. So if they are, these are all zero, then the number of employees and then everything else zero, that means we have eight employees in 
uh, in, uh, with an engineering manager. For every other um, employee, we use one hot encoding and we, we just put one and zero for other departments. If every, every other department is zero, that means we are using the last um, kind of uh, department. So this is how you convert m different possible values into m minus one binary variables. Um, so once you define, once you prepare your model and then you create your model, then um, uh, you, what you need to do is that you need to estimate the weights or w, WJs. Uh, uh, the, uh, the basic model that is used for uh, finding these is um, it's a closed um, like algorithm and uh, you could use uh, ordinary list of squares, OLS, um, and uh, you just calculate, use these uh, difference between them and just you can find it in any stat book how uh, you could actually do that. And it helps you uh, uh, find the WJs, which are the weights of the uh, linear regression. And when you find a linear regression line, it's actually a line, um, and uh, we could, with one variable, we could show that line uh, on a 2D plot. With more variables, it's going to be multidimensional plots, and then we've got surfaces and the dimensions um, increase. But um, based on the input examples, so um, when you say uh, when we put i equals 1 to n, we mean that we're looking for a line that um, is close to uh, the um, sample vector that we have. So the, all the samples that we have, for example, we have 100 different samples that we try to fit into our model. So these 100 samples are represented as dots in here. Um, and we try to find a line that kind of passes um, um, in a way that is closest to the overall, uh, to our samples in general. Um, there, there is one line that usually there is a, maybe one line that is close to all of them and minimizes this um, difference between the line and the actual values of our samples. And that's the line that we find and um, we create. However, that, that line creates some differences like that there's some residuals between the line and the actual um, samples that we have so um, so we could show that residual uh, you could see that residual here and how the line looks like and um, these these are actual our error terms so the um, the error terms of the regression model that difference is um, calculate by getting the actual values um, minus the uh, by subtracting that from the estimated value of that specific line. So this the estimated value usually lines on the line, but the actual value is maybe on the line, maybe not. So the observed value of the error term uh, we can kind of uh, express it like that. And uh, the errors is errors, we assume them to be normally distributed um, with a mean of zero and a constant variance. So we assume that, well, for a specific um, like num uh, input, like usually the actual value lies something around that line and there is an error term uh, with a mean of zero and a constant variance align the whole line. So that's the error or the residual and the lower it is it's the better our model is um, so now let's see how we could um, interpret our um, our model so once we find the values uh, the coefficients and the binary uh, the bias as well then the um, linear regression model looks like this expression expression that uh, has all the input variables there, like those input variables, and there's a coefficient beside them. So how can we interpret that? Um, each weight beside each input variable determines the change in the output variable um, uh, based on a unit of change in that specific feature, 
when everything else is actually um, stays the, everything else stays the same. So, um, for example, um, if the uh, when the W one is two point two, that means um, we have we need two point two hours per week in meetings for each additional employee managed. So if everything stays the same uh, for the same, uh, I guess, manager or anything, we need two, um, I mean, kind of 2.2 more hours per employee. But if, what if, how can we interpret this if this is a binary input variable? Like, what does it mean if I've got 0 0.5 for finance? So remember something, remember that all these binary variables, they were the different, uh, like if they were all zero, um, the base uh, variable was mm, the final feature, but final possible uh, feature of our, like the category of the manager. So it was the engineering manager. So if sales is zero, manufacturing is zero, and finance is zero, then um, these four plus 2.2 employees reflects the model for an engineering manager. So when you see that there is a, uh, when you converted some binary variable and then you see a coefficient beside it, what it means is that um, it, re it represents the additive difference from the reference level, which is uh, in our case is the engineering managers. So when you want to interpret that, it's like finance managers interpreting this term, it means finance managers meet half an hour per week more than engineer managers uh, do. So that's the difference between that. And what about for manufacturing? It's a negative value. So um, they meet 1.49 hours less than um, um, engineer managers. So you could even compare these two by adding or removing the features. Um, Something you need to look at here is you need to make you need to take a look and see if the variables, if the coefficients are significantly more than zero, um, which means like we found a significant relationship. If they're not, it's probably maybe sometimes noise and they're not related at all. Um, so diagnostics, if you want to know if your model is working properly or not, um, um, what you could do is just um, uh, similar to other classification algorithms. You need to use your holdout data. So you set aside some training data, you create your model, um, you set aside some test data. So you create your model based on the training data, and then you test your model on the unseen data. If your model performs well, then um, it's a good model. If not, well, you may want to see what can be done on it and maybe modify the variables, take a look at it, etc. Um, if you want to make sure that your model works well on when trained on all data and how it can perform on all unseen data, then you could use n-fold cross-validation. You cannot, you can never, um, train your model on all your training data and then try to test it on the same data because that's not an unseen data anymore, that's a seen data. So um, what you do is that you could create different partitions. This is, uh, this is known as n-fold cross-validation. You create some uh, different partitions um, and um, training sets. For example, if you have, um, if you're choosing um, you're keeping from, um, if, if you um, um, divide your data set into three different units, um, then you put two units of it for training and one unit of it for testing. But which three units? So you could change that. So you see we've got D1, D2, D3, D1, D2, D3, these are the different sets. Once you, uh, once you train it using two parts of it and test it using the third part, another time you change those two parts for training and test it using the third unseen data, 
and then the last time you train it on all of the other data and then train it on the last unseen data. And once you've done that, you can calculate the error terms or res uh, residuals. You calculate the residuals on the whole group and um, you estimate the prediction error as an average over all the residuals and all the error terms that you receive. Um, so you just get the average of whatever um, metric you use to have, um, evaluate your model. Um, there is another uh, factor that you could use. There's another metric that is popular for um, like regression model and that is uh, R squared. So R squared um, is, a, um, is a metric that you could use which um, is a fraction of the variability in the outcome variable explained by the fitted uh, regression model. It gives you um, zero that in indicates the poorest model to one which indicates a perfect fit. And uh, it's, it's simply calculated using this formula. So um, it subtracts the, um, this formula from one. And um, basically, if you have, if your data is a perfect fit, so this is the actual value of your um, samples, and this is the estimated samples, okay? So if the estimate of your model exactly matches your, um, uh, the actual value of the, of the, um, the sample, then for every all n samples, this, this term will be zero, right? And then R squared will be one. Otherwise, it will be a term between um, zero and one. So the more error you have, it basically becomes uh, like uh, the more it uh, becomes separate from one. Um, so you could use this in um, like, R, R, R squared score, uh, you could use it in scikit-learn, uh, that metrics. Um, so you, if you have your true values, um, which is actual yi's for your input sample and then some predicted uh, outputs, uh, then you could just give it to R, R2 a square and a score and it gives you the actual R, uh, sorry, R, R, yeah, R squared, um, yeah. So you give it to uh, this method and it gives you the R squared. Uh, other, other things, other uh, considerations for this model is that if you want to identify any correlated models, um, uh, any correlated, correlated variables, because correlated, uh, correlated input variables are going to cause some problem for linear regression, You'd better use just uncorrelated uh, variables. So you could use um, a scatter plots to see if two variables are basically uh, quite correlated or not. If they are correlated, try to choose only one of them. Uh, do not use correlated values because it's gonna. Um, it doesn't going to give you um, a meaningful coefficient in if the change is a split between two co correlated values. And sanity check the coefficients that are given to you. Like, do the are the magnitudes excessively large? Like, it might be a, a sign that you need to check your actual input variables, or do the signs actually make sense? Um, again, this is going to be a um, like you want this to be more interpretable to the human being. This is a model that. Um, enables you to actually know how to change input variables to get a specific output and how things uh, input affects output. So uh, in this case, um, it's okay if you want to choose um, like variables that have the actual values instead of just normalizing them if, if they're not very uh, quite uh, different from each other. But normalization always helps all these models and tells you exactly um, which of them are affecting your model more. So in general, um, it's a very concise representation um, of the coefficients. A lot of people love this model, especially in um, maybe uh, finance. Like a lot of people like this because it's very 
easing explains a lot of things quite simple. Sometimes some people say like try linear regression, see if it works. If it doesn't, then try other things. Um, um, in general, it tells you a lot about your data if your model is simple. So it's robust to redundant and correlated values. So it loses some explanatory values, but um, explanatory, but it is a, um, it's okay if you have that. So it may split that significance between two different variables. For example, if you have, it's an obvious variable, like if you have the temperature in Celsius and also the temperature in Fahrenheit uh, in your data set and you put both of them and uh, the weather or I don't know, like there is, you have the outcome variable depends on the weather. Uh, instead of getting the actual coefficient for the temperature, you get half the coefficient for the Fahrenheit degrees and the half of the coefficient for the centigrade degrees. And you think both are important, but it's actually the temperature that is important. Um, and if you just use one of them because they're completely correlated, um, it just tells you exactly how much your output relies on the temp temperature, which is the feature, not that um, uh, correlated uh, feature that is created there. So it loses some explanatory uh, value if you have correlated features, but it will work. Um, so the explanatory value is something that linear regression um, provides to you, which is quite valuable. And uh, it's actually the relative impact of each variable on the outcome. And it's easy to score the data. Um, you just put it in the expression and done. Um, you've got the variables. It's very fast to get the output. Um, there are some problems with it. To ca some cautions, it does not handle missing values very well. There are better models that can handle missing values. Um, it's um, like you need to have some the values there so that it is multiplied by that coefficient. It assumes that each uh, variable affects the outcome linearly and additively. There are ways that you could make sure that your data is kind of trans uh, transformed in a way that it could be used, but if you know that the relationship is not linear, um, then linear regression might not be the best model for you. Um, and it's a good idea to take the log or a square root of the monetary amount so that it is kind of a standardized. And standardization is a good idea. Normalization here, um, as like in all models, before using any models, it's a good practice, anyways. Um, so does not easily handle variables that affect the outcome in a discontinuous way. So if you have some step functions, like you have one, two, three, four only, not nothing in between, then um, like those are kind of a step functions that it may not provide that exact, um, it may give you some um, like coefficient that does not reflect that very well. And it does not work well with categorical attributes, which have many different distinct values like zip codes. If you've got zip codes, which is a lot, like I guess, uh, yeah, there are thousands of them, then uh, you have to create a lot of uh, variables and it's not going to be easy to just optimize it or it's not gonna perform very well. Um, so make sure that um, if your categories are small limited this is a good this is could work but if it's not then you might want to use some other model like naive base is a better model for you okay if you had any questions let me know or comment uh, below okay thank you